Hi, everybody. My name is Sheila Moravati. I'm the founder and CEO of habitsofwaste.org. I'm also the author of a new book called Imperfect Environmentalist, How to Reduce Waste and Create Change for a Better Planet. I am so excited to have this um, How Small Changes Make Big Impact conversation with this extremely esteemed group of panelists. I'm truly honored that they agreed and said yes. Um, we are excited to share all of the information that we get today with um, our friends across the world on during New York Climate Week. So today our, and our goal really is to um, dispel this myth that I keep on getting from people, that I'm only one person. How can I make a difference? Um, there's billions of people in this world. The problems are too big. The corporations are really who we have to blame, not us. It's not about me. It's not about you. But there's some experts here who will help us walk through all of that and truly explain how important it is that each and every one of us that wakes up in the morning and goes to bed by nighttime realizes the power we hold and how each and every one of us have a responsibility to the sake of our planet to take action and speak out. And there's a variety of ways we can do that. So with that, I would love to introduce you all to our beautiful panelists and maybe Martina, you can go first and then we'll go around and give everybody a little chance to say um, hello. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Martina Donlin and I work at the United Nations headquarters in New York where I lead the climate communications work in the global communications department. Uh, and that includes our Act Now campaign for individual action and that's why I'm here on this panel today. Welcome, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Edward Walker. I'm a professor in the Department of Sociology at UCLA. Uh, I study social movements and social change, uh, particularly focused around environmental movements. Um, uh, I'm the co-chair of the World Economic Forum uh, Global Future Council on Net Zero Living as well. And hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony Lazowitz. I'm a professor at the Yale School of the Environment, where I direct the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. We study how people around the world are responding to the issue of climate change and how to better engage them in climate action. Hi, I'm Leslie Crutchfield, Executive Director of Business for Impact at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. Uh, at Georgetown, I get to teach in the MBA program courses on corporate social responsibility, nonprofit leadership and management. And I came to Georgetown um, to write a book about social movements. And it's called How Change Happens and looks at why some social movements succeed while others don't. And so glad to be here. Well, did I tell you guys this was an esteemed panel or what? So I don't know if we could have any more experts in the world in this panel than this. So thank you again, all of you for being a part of this. I know how busy you are, but because we have such a short amount of time, let's jump right in. I have a few questions here for you all. Um, for those of you who are joining us live, please feel free to put some questions in the chat. We're gonna try and save some time at the end um, to, to ask everybody here about your questions as well in case I've missed anything. Um, as I said earlier in the intro, I get this question constantly that I'm an individual and I don't think I have any say in what happens with our climate. The onus shouldn't be on us and it should be on um, corporations. We play a very small part in the grand scheme of things. Tony, can you please explain to us how individual action can actually be very powerful and effective? Sure. My pleasure. Um, so first of all, I would just say, and I hear this question a lot too, and it's always framed as, well, should we be doing individual action or should we be doing systemic action? And I think that's a false choice. It's not an either or, it's a both and. So, you know, how can the individual make a difference? Well, first of all, we just have to recognize that this problem is fundamentally driven by the burning of fossil fuels and land use change, most notably agriculture and deforestation. And as a result, the real driver of all of this are the choices and the decisions and the behavior of 8 billion people. So we are all part of this, okay? This is in our transportation choices and our energy choices and our consumer choices, what products and services we're gonna prefer, our dietary choices, our lifestyle choices, and of course, our political voting choices. All of those are gonna be critical for every single human being because those are the activities that ultimately drive uh, climate change. But at the same time, we have to think about how can we amplify our, our power as individuals? And so one area I wanna to point to that we often don't think about is the power of example. 
The impact of your individual action is not limited to your own carbon footprint. Some of your actions are social signals to everyone else around you. One of my colleagues here at Yale has done this great study finding that as soon as one household in a neighborhood puts solar panels on their roof, it increases the odds that another household in that neighborhood puts solar panels on their roof. And when the next one does it again, it increases the odds that another household does it. That's just one of literally thousands of examples. Every time you go through the checkout counter at the grocery store, you're looking at the purchases of the person ahead of you and behind you in line. And guess what? They're looking at what you're buying too. You are constantly sending social signals to everyone around you about what a sustainable lifestyle looks like. So you are in fact amplifying your impact. But the real power, and this is where I'm really excited to hear from my colleagues, the real power comes from individuals joining together in organizations to demand systemic change, where one plus one doesn't equal two, one plus one equals 10. Okay? That's the power of social movements. And uh, again, really looking forward to what our colleagues have to say. Wonderful. Um, Leslie, I'd love to jump in and ask you, large corporations are being blamed for the majority of our climate crisis. What does it take for corporations to hear us and begin to find alternate solutions to make, meet their goals in a cleaner, more efficient way? Well, thanks again for having me. And certainly the behaviors and activities of corporations are key contributors to the status. And as Tony mentioned, uh, our individual behaviors as well. I think um, through our research on movements and at how change happens, we looked at the interaction between companies and um, individuals and collectives, consumer action groups, uh, nonprofit watchdog groups. And uh, one thing that's really changed is the contract between business and society is really changing. Um, these days, um, you see consumers and activists demanding that companies take a stand on issues, whether it's related to the environment or um, health issues or personal identity issues. And um, in, the, in, the, in the old days of CSR, a company could have a strategy that was basically just to stay out of the headlines. But these days, um, you know, if you're not taking a stand and being very transparent about what your position is on a particular issue, you know, consumers, activists are going to think you're um, a bad actor. So there's there's pressure, and a lot of this is actually driven, of course, as a result of the uh, proliferation of social media and digital technologies. Um, I think if you look at it from a collective action point of view, one of the most powerful examples is when um, nonprofits, NGOs, uh, collectively come together to try and get companies to change their practices internally. And I, I think a lot about um, uh, one of the, the early green partnerships between Environmental Defense Fund and uh, McDonald's. Now this takes us back to the 80s when solid waste was the major culprit and we weren't as focused on carbon at that time. And unlike many of the other green groups at the time, Environmental Defense Fund um, had a view that if they could partner with McDonald's, not take any money, but audit and make recommendations for how they could reduce the overall packaging waste, uh, get rid of those styrofoam clamshells, for instance, that the Big Macs used to come in. I see you nodding. We've all had the Big Macs. Um, and, um, and ultimately, by getting uh, a company to change how it operates, they were able to reduce solid waste by 150,000 metric tons over a period of time. And then you also get to this uh, a ripple effect, this leverage effect, because of course all the other fast food joints can't be having unrecycled materials and using styrofoam. So the KFCs and the Wendy's of the world uh, can follow suit. Um, it starts with, um, in this case, it was an NGO that was um, willing to look at how they could work with business to affect a change rather than the more traditional us versus them, you know, protest, boycott, boycott kind of approach. All of those strategies um, are effective and needed at certain points. Um, but one of the big things that we've seen um, in recent years is uh, more of a willingness to partner and try and find the ways that work with business, not just against it. Great. 
It's really helpful. We've actually experienced something very much like that through our cutout cutlery campaign. When you work with the with the companies, it's so much more effective. So thank you for that. Um, Ed, this one's for you. Most sociologists think that the American civil rights movement as the archetype of social movements, how do we need to change how we reimagine social movements in the 21st century? Thanks, Sheila. That's a really great question. And you know, so many of the lessons that we've learned about social movements come from the civil rights movement, right? Which tactics work? Um, when is government going to be more likely to concede to what a movement's demanding, the best way to frame your arguments, and so much more? I would say most of, not all of those things are still as equally applicable today. Um, but I just want to highlight what I think of as three things about modern movements that um, might look just a little bit different. And if you'll forgive the alliteration, I would say they're moments, means, and multiple institutions. Mm -hmm. um, on moments, you know, we have a lot of moment-based movements in the last decade, right? We had Me Too after Harvey Weinstein. We have Black Lives Matter after Ferguson and after the murder of George Floyd. We have some very large-scale demonstrations that were moments of their own, right? The Women's Marches in 2017 and afterward. And these moments can help to build movements around big impacts, right? We've seen this also in a variety of other places, right? Think about what Deepwater Horizon did as a sort of environmental catastrophe, as a moment that you could kind of build movement action around. It's not to say that those moments don't generate major backlash. Sometimes they really do. I mean, think about the anti-EDI turn we've seen in companies and schools and other institutions in the last few years. But one of the things I think we need to wrestle with today is, you know, how do you take that moment or that hashtag and turn it into new policy? Um, my take is that you need to organize and we can think more together as we go on about organizing and what that should look like. Um, and second point, means, right? The means of getting people together today look a bit different than they did then. You often had this phenomenon of what's sometimes called you know, organizing without organizations. You could get large numbers of people together through online campaigns. Um, on the other hand, you know, is it always as meaningful when people aren't coming together or face-to-face? -to -face? You can get a massive number of people to take action, um, but, you know, maybe people check out after a certain amount of time. Um, and so, you know, what I've worried about is, you know, do we have a lot of mobilizing that is people taking action without as much organizing where people are actually coming together and building long-term connections. And that's something that I think a lot of movements are struggling with today and some are doing it pretty well. Um, third thing, um, movements need to work through multiple institutions. Um, the civil rights movement was mainly about, not entirely, but mainly about uh, change through government. Um, and to be clear, government's of course still a central source of power in society. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, When government sneezes, the rest of our social institutions catch a cold. <laughs> Um, but the challenge is that government systems are now, you know, filled with partisan gridlock, trusting government is at historic lows, so it can be a real uphill battle. And I think we need to acknowledge, and many people on the call have experience with this, you know, how do you make change through other kinds of institutions? Can you change business and industry practices? Can you change government standards um, set by non-governmental actors and non-governmental organizations, um, educational institutions, voluntary associations? Can you change individual behaviors in meaningful ways? So my thought is about how we kind of bring together, you know, all three of these parts, right? These moments, these means, these multiple institutions as, you know, uh, vehicles for social change. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Um, we need a moment for climate change, I think, that's uh, going to be as big and wide and understood, like urgent soon, um, so that we can create those next steps. Martina, um, the United Nations is known for dealing with governments at a global level, but you also have a campaign to drive citizen action called to Act Now. Can you tell us more about it? Yes. So um, as an intergovernmental organization, the UN, of course, mainly deals with national governments and to address global issues that often know no borders like the climate crisis. But we also speak directly to the people because the people of course, have to be part of the solution and, and, and want to be the, want to do their part. So that's why we created the Act Now campaign a few years back. Um, it provides entry points for everyone everywhere to, to take action, be it on sustainability, on climate, on peace, on human rights. Um, it recommends actions you can take. Uh, it allows you to join the movement by logging your actions through a mobile app. To, be, to feel like you're part of a movement um, for bigger change. Because just as Tony said, I mean, individual action and systemic change go hand in hand. Our ultimate objective always is systemic change, but we need the people's support. We need the people's pressure. Um, and as citizens, as consumers, as voters, we can use our voice, our wallet, our vote, to, to make a difference, right? And to send those signals and put pressure on leaders 
and, and drive the bigger change. Um, and that's why we have the Act Now campaign. It has accumulated almost 23 million actions logged around the world, and that's um, mostly on overwhelmingly on climate. Um, so actions like, you know, I took public transport instead of a car, or I ate a vegan meal, or I switched to green energy for my home. Um, sending a signal that, you know, people are ready for change, people are taking action, and we need the bigger systemic change to, to follow. Yeah, talks about all that grassroots pressure going from the bottom, top down. It really does work. Um, Tony, speaking of which, I would love to talk a little bit about micro actions and macro change. And here at Habits of Waste, we really believe that these are kind of two entities and we like to be the bridge between the two so that people can realize that their micro actions can create that macro change. So basically back to the title of our panel, small changes, big impact. So my question to you is, studies show that there is a vast array of concern for, my, for climate change and for activating action. Can you explain the connection between micro actions and macro change and how to bridge the two? Perhaps this might be an inspiration for people to know that the first they have to take a first step, they have to get started and how. Yeah, so I would just say the larger point is that one action can lead to the next, which can lead to the next, which can lead to the next across domains, right? Not just about, again, reducing your own carbon footprint or that of your household, but ultimately leading to joining and uh, being part of organizations that are demanding larger scale systemic change. But there is nothing automatic about that. It's very easy for an individual to say, okay, I changed my light bulbs, I did my bit, or I don't know what else to do, which is the more often common answer. So just to put this in a little context in the US, in our studies here in the US, we find that there's about 37 million Americans who are already alarmed about climate change and willing to join a campaign to convince elected officials to take greater climate action. 37 million people. That is an enormous potential movement, but the great majority of them have not done so, not yet. And so we have asked, well, why not? What is the main barrier that's preventing you from uh, getting involved? The number one answer, nobody's ever asked me to. Wow. The number two answer, I wouldn't know who would elected officials to contact. And the third answer is I wouldn't know what to say. Now, all three of those are exactly the role of civil society organizations, to recruit, to train, to empower, and deploy their members to advocate for change, okay? And the last point I just wanna make about that is that when you do that as part of a group of people, because we are social animals, you're not only far more likely to take the next step and the next step and the next step, okay? that joining together with others to achieve a shared goal makes you far more powerful, far more likely to achieve that shared goal. But ideally, it should be way more fun because you're doing it with other people, okay? And I would just say we do not embrace the fun and yes, even the joy of being part of a movement that is working together and starting to rack up small, medium, and ultimately large scale wins as part of an organization. So I just wanna underscore how important what Ed said earlier is, organize, organize, organize. Yeah, and, and make it fun. I mean, we, we forget about that part of this whole thing. Uh, I mean, completely, I even forget about it sometimes. And this is what I do day in, day out. And actually it brings me to my qu question for Leslie, which is very similar to what you said, you know, at, here at, at my organization's Habits of Waste, we create um, templates, like email templates that we've written out with the emails of whoever we're trying to shift, you know, something. And so let's say, for example, um, Hollywood, we're trying to get all of Hollywood to listen and not show plastic on screen. And we have all of the names and emails of the people written in there. We just need people to come in and click once and participate with us. We don't know if this is necessarily the best approach. It's worked for us. So I think, Leslie, that's my question to you is, how do you create a groundswell of supporters to push corporations to comply with your with the suggested change that's being made or requested? And is there a proven model to create change within corporations through these types of grassroots efforts? Well, it's interesting uh, just hearing uh, Tony's uh, description of you know willing and caring environmental activists without a place to plug in. It's sort of the missing movement, right? Yeah. Um, and 
it's interesting. It reminds me of um, uh, the founding of Moms Demand Action, which joined up with Mayors Against Illegal Guns, what we currently know now is Every Town for Gun Safety, um, and uh, which is a leading gun control advocacy group here in the United States. And um, when Shannon Watts, the founder of Moms Demand Action, um, was confronted with the horror of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting in 2006. She was a stay-at-home mom in Indianapolis, and she got online and Googled, what's the MAD of gun control? MAD being Mothers Against Drunk Driving. I want to join the movement against guns rather than the movement to confront drunk driving-related death and injury. And, and she got no answer from her Google search. And so she started a Facebook page, and that became Moms Demand Action. And um, eventually um, that, that teamed up with Bloomberg's Mayor Against Illegal Guns. And um, by creating that Facebook phase, page and finding other moms um, similarly um, outraged uh, about the mass shootings that and the, the urban gun deaths that happen you know, daily in this country. And you know, one of the first actions that they took at Moms Demand Action was you know, trying, like you said, to uh, go to elected officials. Well, because of the power of the National Rifle Association, the NRA, highly organized at the time, had about 5 million members. More importantly, state and local affiliations, they were highly organized and activated, you know, so that anytime, whether at a town council meeting or a state legislator uh, discussion, the issue of gun rights was on the table, they were there affirming and defending their Second Amendment freedoms. And for a long time, there were no grassroots um, opposition on the gun control side. That began to change with every town. But um, another thing that the Moms Demand Action Group did was, you know, they used some of the classic boycott strategies, you know, skip Starbucks Saturdays as Starbucks was allowing open carry in some of their stores. So targeting different retail outlets to try and um, uh, create, you know, energy against uh, and and get at businesses at their pocketbooks, right? Um, the bottom line is the way to get businesses to listen. Unfortunately, at least in my research, I'd be curious to hear from the other uh, folks who study this on the on our Zoom. Um, you know, boycotts tend to be sort of flash in the pan. They don't necessarily stick. Um, you know, you many might remember the outrage after the the Pepsi commercial, where you know they had a, a celebrity handing a Pepsi to a cop on a you know anti police brutality demonstration, and uh, that was just extremely not well received. Um, and and Pepsi took like a small hit that quarter, but no one really talks about that anymore, right? Um, so I think um, one of the ways for grassroots groups to try and tap into companies to get them to change is to actually work through the inside, through employee resource groups, right? In every big company, particularly these days, you've got all kinds of identity groups formulating. Certainly the um, same-sex marriage equality and LGBT marriage movement really um, got momentum even back as early as the 70s and 80s um, as employee resource resource groups were coming together to try and um, defend and advance rights. So I think working through uh, the workforce, right. which is a really important stakeholder, um, you can get some collective power um, and be heard from within would be- I actually approach. think that's a really good point. And sometimes when you have a partner kind of within the organization that you're working toward change making, it's super helpful to understand what's going on in there and help. Um, Ed, are there some other ways that we can persuade corporations to help the climate movement um, other than trying to convince them of what's in their best interest? For example, is it best to try to embarrass them for in you know the eyes of the public opinion, or do we need to talk to them about their bottom line? What are the best ways to create that you know urgency for change? It's a really important question. I mean, I tend to see companies as a really important part of social change campaigns, and I think we need to really think carefully about how to involve them as meaningful partners. Now, there's a challenge, right? I mean, a lot of social movement organizations and firms have audiences that are in opposition, 
The activist groups might define their identities as actively against the damages that they believe firms are imposing on the world, and they might worry uh, about you know alienating some of their supporters if they were to partner with companies or be seen as selling out in some way. You know, the firms might worry that teaming up with certain activist groups could alienate some of their customer base. Um, so there's always this kind of tension here. And then on top of this, there's what I think of as the sort of frenemies issue here too, where sometimes the firms have pay, faced activist pressure in the past. They've been named and shamed, um, but they, you know, for that reason, they want that naming and shaming to go away. So they might partner with people who uh, might have problems with them, even though there are risks. So this, these kinds of things are all really important to consider. Um, I think the thing that activists need to consider around this is vulnerability for the firms, right? I don't. I think activists really need to think about it, what it looks like from inside the firm or the industry's perspective, um, both with respect to the friendlier side of things, partnerships and coalitions, but also on the harsher side around boycott, street protests, and potentially disruptive kinds of tactics. So, you know, what do we mean by this? So, you know, vulnerability. Um, and we're thinking about the findings from a number of research studies in the literature that. Um, you know, many of my colleagues have produced, um, you know, firms are more likely to concede to boycotts when the firm themselves have been experiencing a decline in their sales, or if they've had a hit to their reputation recently, they're much more likely to give in. Um, firms are more likely to be open to partnering with activist groups if they were previously targeted by those activists, and that softened them up and put them in a weaker position. Other things, you know, disruptions to supply chains, um, these kinds of things can leave firms vulnerable and activists can use that to their advantage. So there's one other issue worth raising here too, right? We've got both moderate groups out there and we've got more radical groups that are out there. And in my discipline of sociology, there's a common finding about what's sometimes called the radical flank effect. Uh, the idea is that, you know, you've got moderates out there pushing for incremental reforms and you've got radicals out there who want to sort of, you know, burn it all down, so to speak. Um, and, you know, this idea comes from the civil rights movement, actually, um, where, you know, after a lot of the riots that took place in the late 60s, the moderate civil rights groups started to get a lot more funding. Um, and so it actually helped the funding of the moderate groups that the radical groups were out there pressing. And you see this kind of thing happening all the time today where, um, you know, you've got groups on both sides of things. And, um, and, you know, that can actually help the position of groups that are trying to make incremental reform. So on the whole, I would say the message is really think carefully about what companies are going through and what their vulnerabilities are and how you can use that to your advantage in trying to build a movement. That's a great point. Thank you so much. Um, Martina, since we're running out of time, I'm going to put the two last questions together in yours because I want everyone to know how to do this. What are some of the most impactful small actions that can spark big change and how can people join the Act Now campaign at the UN? Yeah, and, and I'll keep it brief. So um, if we look at the science and we're looking mostly at the UN Environment Program uh, studies on this, you know, the, the three main areas where you can bring down your own carbon footprint in your own life, in most of people's lives, uh, it's in the three areas of transport, uh, food and energy. Um, and we spell out some actions on the UN Act Now website that specifically that you can take that have a pretty big impact and with which you can, again, model behavior and bring others along to also drive change and to send the right signals to leaders, to decision makers that we want renewable energy, energy. we want wind and solar, uh, we want more public transport, we want more energy efficient appliances, um, et cetera, right? We need to send those signals. But the probably the most impactful action, and others have, of course, focused on that as well, is really speaking up, joining movements, bringing others along, and having that multiplier effect. Um, and that's what we're really looking for. And and we have um, on the Act Now website a whole page on speak up and how to do that. Of course, it very much depends on the local and national circumstances, and we are not a grassroots NGO, so we really depend on the local organizations to connect the global with the local um, and help drive that change. We, as the UN, we can provide the global call to action, you know, a global frame that's often very motivating for people that they're joining a global movement. This is a problem everywhere, and there's things everyone everywhere can do. So. To do that, you know, go to un.org slash act now, and you'll see a link to download the mobile app. There you get more info. You can log your actions and really be part of that global movement. And most importantly, speak to your friends and colleagues and bring others on board and keep sending the right signals to our decision makers and uh, uh, to drive that bigger change. Thanks. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Martina. So for me, my takeaways are have fun, mobilize a big group of people to do this with you 
tell people about it, multiply your effects and know that people are watching and learning from you, even if you're not even saying anything among many other important facts that were raised today. Um, it, just because I want to respect everybody's time, I could go on for another hour with you guys, but um, it is it is that we are at time. And so I want to just say a big thank you to everyone who joined us today. Thank you to our panelists. And we're excited to share this work with everybody during New York Climate Week. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.